Ron from Harrisburg. We'll end with this. When and how did you find out pro wrestling was a work? Also, if you had any child fans in your life, how and when would you tell them? Uh, I think I've told the story before. I'm pretty sure. I mean, I knew when I was a lot younger. I kind of, I kind of knew. I don't remember what age. I think it was like a gradual thing. But the story that I remember was back in '92. Uh, I was in school. We were at recess. There was a payphone in the building on the uh, the first floor, and at recess, all of the kids, well, not all of them, but like four or five of them in the class, piled into this phone booth. And I couldn't imagine what they were doing. Like, who are they calling? So I'm kind of in the back. I'm not actually in the phone booth, but I'm standing there trying to eavesdrop and listen to what's going on. And they were on the, they never spoke to anybody. They made a phone call. The call ended, and one of the kids, his name was Keith, I remember, he said, oh, Ric Flair is going to win the Royal Rumble. And I'm like, how do they know? Of course, it was it was one of the early wrestling hotlines. I don't know what hotline it was. They obviously called the hotline. Somebody knew. And they heard that Ric Flair was going to win the Royal Rumble. And sure as shit, Ric Flair won the Royal Rumble. And I looked like a genius when I watched that show at my grandparents' house. And uh, we're sitting there, and they're like, who do you think's going to win? And I'm like, Ric Flair. And they're like, what? You're crazy. And sure enough, Ric Flair won, and I looked like the smartest person in the room, and I was the youngest kid. So by then, I definitely knew. But I, I, I'm positive I knew well before that. As far as like if I had a kid or like a nephew or somebody young, you know, how and when would I tell them? I, I honestly I wouldn't want to say anything to them, at least not not at first. I would kind of want them to figure it out on their own. I mean there were other things that I saw too, even before in ninety two, the way guys would throw certain punches that didn't connect and miraculously the other guy would sell for it. You just kind of figure it out over time the more of that sort of thing that you see. And then maybe one day if there was like a major injury angle, somebody got hurt and I saw that they were really uh, <laughs> disturbed by it, maybe then I would kind of tell them, well, he's not really hurt. That that might be the time that I, I say something like, no, he's not hurt. He's only pretending to be hurt. But like nobody ever did that with me when I was a kid. I, I kind of figured it out on my own. And when I think back to my childhood memories of wrestling, I, I'll give you an example. 1987. May have been late 86, but this is probably early 87 at this point. The injury angle that they did with Randy Savage and Ricky Steamboat when he had the ring bell and drove it across uh, Steamboat's throat. And I think actually before that, Steamboat uh, maybe did like a dive to the outside and, and landed throat first on the guardrail. And then I think Savage maybe uh, hit him with the ring bell in the throat. That to me as a kid was the most traumatic thing in the world because this guy is gasping for air he can't breathe I'm sitting there thinking to myself holy shit this guy can't breathe like he's gonna die and it was such a simple angle and they they put him on the stretcher he's like wailing around grabbing his throat he can't breathe he's trying to breathe and he can't that was traumatic to me as a kid okay but I feel like I wouldn't have wanted somebody to say to me at that point, oh, it's not real, don't worry, he's just faking it. Because to me, it would have ruined the whole thing, you know? I feel like there's got to be a period of time that goes by as a kid where you just either let them figure it out on their own, let them be traumatized by a major injury angle, you know? I wouldn't have wanted somebody to tell me that that wasn't real at that time. I still think back to that angle and I'm like, man, that, you know, it was such a simple angle, but like I remember vividly at that time being really bothered and really disturbed by what this man had done to Ricky Steamboat. And then Steamboat came back for his revenge, and, and you know, it's such a sim- simple story. So I would be hesitant to say anything, I think. Uh, you reach a certain age, and I guess if they still haven't figured it out, then you just kind of say to them, listen, hey, it's, you know, it's entertainment. And then, oh, what do you mean by that? And then you got to explain it and... I just think you're robbing the kid of his childhood if you tell them too early, you know, and I don't know what that age is. It all depends on when you become a fan. Some kids don't become fans until they're eight or nine. Some kids are fans like I was. I started watching it, you know, sitting in front of the TV when I was four and five years old. You know, no wonder I was traumatized by the whole Steamboat Savage thing with the ring bell. Maybe it would have been different had I not gotten into wrestling until much later on, um... So I would be hesitant to say anything right away. There does come a point where you got to say something if they haven't figured it out on their own. I think most smart kids, though, will figure it out on their own. So that's probably how I would handle it. I kind of miss those days, actually, where I did think that all of that stuff was real. I almost feel like if I came up as a wrestling fan now, some of the stuff they do, it would be almost impossible 
to just buy into any of this stuff. And I know there are kids who do, but it just it boggles my mind. Some of the ridiculous shit that they do now. And how you do an injury angle. Like a modern day version of the Steamboat Savage thing, you could say, would be like the Bray Wyatt-Dean Ambrose angle from SmackDown all those weeks.